Hello, everyone. A very good morning to all of you. I hope everyone is keeping well, and it's a very beautiful sunny day here. Um, I think you all had a wonderful session yesterday. It was um, very informative. There was a very wide variety of topics uh, that we had discussed, right from autopsy pathology to toxicology pathology. We had some very nice histopathology uh, you know, case examples. And uh, we spoke about the more recent advances in digital pathology and AI. And of course, about new adjuvant and adjuvant therapy. And I think it was, um, you know, very diverse and very useful and interesting topics for the team. Uh, we are looking forward to a very uh, equally interactive and interesting presentation from dynamic speakers today as well. I hope um, you're all finding it very useful as well as interesting and informative. Um, this is a global gathering of um, pathologists and, uh, you know, I'm Dr. Radhakrishnan. I spoke to you all yesterday and chaired the early mo morning session. I have the pleasure of chairing the session this morning as well. And uh, we will now begin the day two sessions. We have, uh, as I shared, a very nice array of speakers. You're going to be sharing some very interesting and informative topics. Uh, without further ado, I would like to now introduce our first speaker of the day. Professor Laila Tahiri Elishoti. I hope I pronounced your name properly, uh, from Morocco. We are really excited to have you on board, um, passing on the stage to yourself for, to take over for your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, you could unmute yourself, Dr. Professor Tahiri. Yes, it's thank okay. You. Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm so glad to, to be with you for the second time this year. Uh, it's, uh, I'm honored uh, to present uh, my, uh, my study uh, to everyone. I'll, I will, uh, I will share, uh, share the presentation or you will uh, present my slides. I'm pleased to share your presentation. Thank you. You could share your presentation. Uh, Professor Tahiri, um, are you able to share your presentation? Okay. It's okay? Yes, we can see it. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I will start now or we will uh, attend it's... Uh... Um, yes, please. Uh, I think we, you can get started, definitely. Thank you. Okay, I will start. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Leila Tahiri from uh, uh, Morocco, uh, uh, Central Region of Morocco. I'm glad to present you today uh, uh, the results of our study about uh, extra renal malignant rhabdoid tumor, it, uh, about uh, four cases. 
to introduce, uh, as uh, we all know, the malignant rhabdo tumor uh, is a rare and aggressive uh, tumor presenting in the pediatric population. It's characterized by a clinical pleomorphism because of the different locations that they can affect. Their grouping within a single entity is uh, it, recent following the discovery of uh, bialylic inactivation of hsnf 5 in one tumor suppressor gene in tumoral cells. The positive diagnostic diagnosis is, an, is anatomopathological and immunohistochemical analysis. Uh, analysis. Uh, therapeutic management remains multidisciplinary in the, in the absence of any pre-established consensus. And the present study aims to highlight the different epidemiological, clinical, histopathological, and, uh, and feathers of extra renal with tumor in uh, children, and to evaluate the, uh, the evolutionary profile of our patients to compare our research with those of literature. We present a retrospective and descriptive study about four cases of extra renal rhabdoid tumor that uh, collected on our uh, Department of Pathology and Biopathology in University Hospital Center of Hassan II of Fez in Morocco during a period uh, ranging from 2014 to 2021. The histological analysis uh, is, uh, uh, has been performed on formalin fixed and paraffin embedded tissue sections with hematoxylin using saffron staining. And the immunohistochemical analysis was performed on four micromet tissue sections from formalin fixed and uh, paraffin embedded blocks using primary antibodies according to the manufacturer's guidelines with immunohistochemical stainers Montana Benchmark Ultra. For all antibodies, positive and negative cont control uh, were performed, including the processing of normal tissue or tumor sections known to be positive. We have used the following primary on, uh, antibodies for our, uh, for, uh, for our four case, cases. The any one uh, uh, antibody clone BIF, uh, BAF45 uh, SNF525 with a nuclear staining the Vemontin uh, clone uh, V9 with cytoplasmic staining, cytokeratin clone AE1, AE3 with cytoplasmic dot-like pattern uh, staining, uh, epithelial membranous antigen uh, clone E29 uh, with membranous cytoplasmic dot-like pattern uh, staining, and finally, my, uh, myogenin clone LO26 with nuclear staining to differentiate, to, to differentiate uh, malignant rhabdoid tumor uh, from rhabdomyosarcoma. Concerning our results uh, from 2014 to 2021, four cases of extra renal rhabdoid tumor have been recorded at our department, uh, ranging from two to, uh, to seven months uh, all the oral male. The site mostly affected was uh, soft tissue in three patients. For the first case, it affected a he head and neck region in frontal skin uh, that appeared at birth with a voluminous mass, uh, necrotic, heterogeneous, and fully lobed. Uh, the second, uh, the second patient, the second pa patient present uh, with uh, 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 present with a deep axillary. Uh, mass extending to uh, cervical to cervical region. Uh, it, uh, it appeared at third month. The third case is about a vermian localization discovered at fourth month during an extension an exten uh, extension assessment of a post chemotherapy nephrectomy of which the pathological result was a renal rhabdoid tumor. The last case concern an anthraconical retroorbital region with synchronous cerebellar localization appeared at the second week of birth. All our patients did a CT scan, which showed in the first case, uh, 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 for the first case, the presence on the right frontal skin, um, as cutaneous and subcutaneous uh, mass, uh, uh, well limited, fully lobed, with uh, uh, containing fine scarred specification with directly enhanced after contrast adjective in uh, radiology and name on geoma. 
The second case, uh, which uh, in the second case, we show a bulky left axillary tumor mass with the related contours, it originates the enhanced extension to the cervical region. The red, uh, the, the red row extended to, to the cervical region and the proximal portion of ipsilateral <laughs> left arm with irregular border massively necrotic in the center and vascularize, vascularized. For the third case, concerned a very anti-shock process, blue arrow, which is uh, lobulated, which have lobulated contours, heterogeneous in acid extending to the cervical region and proximal portion of uh, uh, extending to, uh, to, the, uh, to the to the to the cerebral hemisphere and compression fourth ventricle anteriorly. Finally, the fourth case shows a left anteroconical ret retroorbital mace lesion tissue, which is uh, uh, responsible for uh, 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 proptosis with a right vermilion cere cerebral uh, lesion that, uh, that may be related to a secondary localization, localization for with tumor. We received different kind of pathological specimen at our laboratory and an exigenal biopsy for the first case uh, and a fine, a fine needle aspiration for the axillary mace, surgical excision for the vermian tumor, and finally a biopsy for retroorbital tumor. This picture uh, shows the imatubidine and eudenstenin demonstrate uh, the presence of rhabdoid cells with which are a large cells, a large cells uh, with abundant cytoplasm and perinuclear spherical inclusion that called the rhabdoid inclusion with a large nuclei and vesicular chromatin, uh, 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 a prominent nucleoli. This picture so, uh, show a cellular, a, cell, a cellular smell MGG stained with individual cells and structural clusters of rubbed with cells and round cells. We, no, we note cytoplasmic inclusion, with, which are eudinophilic. There is a metrotic uh, figure uh, in this uh, smear paper uh, cytology. In this picture, we show uh, the tumor cells were pre predominantly arranged in sheet, uh, and cell, uh, cells uh, contained often abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm with prominent eosinophilic paranuclear inclusion that's called rhabdoid inclusion. On immunohistochemistry study, we noted uh, a complete loss of any one seen in by tumor cells with internal positive control in endothelial cells. However, the tumor cells have cytoplasmic positivity with dot-like uh, pattern for epithelial membrane uh, antigen, cytokeratin, and hemantin. Two of our patients were treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, and, and, uh, the, and the two other patients underwent immediate surgery then adjuvant chemotherapy. The evolution was later for, in all cases after local progression or metastasis. In order to discuss, I remind you the definition of uh, rhabdoid tumor, which morphologically, morphologically contain a population of rhabdoid cells, which are large cells with abundant cytoplasm, perinuclear spherical inclusion, and eccentric vesicular nuclei with large inclusion like nucleoli. The resemblance of this tumor to, rhabd to rhabdomyosarcoma uh, on rhabdomyoblastic feature led to treat beginner period to as rhabdoid tumor, and genetically it's defined by the allylic inactivation of tumor suppressor gene smart uh, cb one uh, This, this uh, group of tumors includes tumors on this, uh, of the central nervous system called atypical therapy with rhabdoid tumor, the, the renal tumor, and soft tissue tumors. Historically, rhabdoid tumor of kidney was first ident identified in 
1978 by Big Big and Palmer as a sarcomatic variant of wild of tumor. In, in, uh, in 1981, Hazanol classified it as a distinct histopathology and uh, entity of kidney tumor. It was called rhabdoid originally to employ rhabdomyosarcoma like features. Now, the rhabdoid features are understood to be cytoplasmic globuloid aggregates of keratin and vimontin and in intermediate filaments. The extra renal rhabdoid tumor was first reported in, 18, uh, in 1982 by Gonzalez, Cruz, and Dahl as the round cell sarcoma of infants and young ch children in liver, chest wall, and soft tissue. Then it was described in central nervous system, system uh, in 1980. 19, in 19, uh, in 1987, by Big and As I said, uh, as I said pre previously, those tumors are gen genetical, uh, genetically defined by the allelic inactivation of the tumor suppressor gene SMARCB1, previously na uh, named HSNF5 or B BAF47 uh, or anyone. Look, this gene located on chromosome 22Q11.2. 20, the inactivation is the, this inactivation is secondary to an inactivating mutations, deletion, or duplications of exon resulting in an immature top codon. The smart CBN1 is one of the core subunite proteins of the ATP dependent SWI SNF chromatin emergent complex. And this figure shows us the different interaction between. Uh, uh, have been demonstrated between SMARCB, SMARCB Unite, SMARCB1, anyone, and case of protein, uh, protein in various pathways uh, related to tumor prof pro proliferation and progression, such as uh, the, 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 P the P17 retinoblastoma path pathway, the WNT uh, pathway, uh, signaling pathway, the sonic head dog signaling pathway, and polycomb pathway. In addition, although, although the various pathways related to mechanism of tumorogenesis and tumor pro proliferation are complex, complexly intertwined, the clarification of this mechanism might contribute to the therapeutic strategies in smart CB1 in one deficient tumor. In terms of pathological classification, smart CB1 in one deficient tumor may be classified by genetic background. Our four, uh, our four tumors described here shared, uh, in spite of disparate sites, important similarities. All arose in, uh, on, in young male infants, all had rapid growth and were quite vol voluminous at the time of their detection, which is comparable to literature data as follow. Extrarenal rhabdoid tumor is ex exceedingly rare, develops mostly in children. However, case, uh, cases have being reported from newborn to teenager and adult. Among fetal and neonatal rhabdoid tumor, the extra renal rhabdoid are more common than are more uh, more common uh, than those in the kidney or brain. An Irish study between uh, 1986 to uh, and uh, 20, uh, 2013 the authors found only four cases by 55 uh, of extra renal, extra cranial rhabdoid tumor uh, located on neck, paravertebral, tongue, and pelvis location. The atypical teratoid with rhabdoid tumor accounts for 1.6% of all pediatric uh, central nervous system tumors and 14% of uh, central nervous system uh, tumors in children uh, aged less than one year. Rhabdoid tumor uh, of the genital organs, uh, uh, organs and gastrointestinal tract typically affected older patients with mean age uh, of 63.4 uh, years, ranging from 41 to uh, 84 years. The sex, the sex ratio ma uh, male to female is of uh, 1.2 to 1. The extrarenal rhabdoid tumor are located on uh, central nervous system as uh, called as atypical teratoid with rhabdoid tumor, 
uh, that can located on cere cerebral hemispheres, cellular region, pineal gland, cerebral hemisphere, or vermis. The soft tissue location can touch neck, paraspinal, perineal, abdomen region, retroperitoneum, pelvis, skin, or orbit. Uh, the liver uh, uh, constitutes 73% uh, uh, of all the cellular organs that touched by rabdu extrarenal rhabdoid tumor. In this paper about extrarenal non-cerebral rhabdoid tumor, authors found that liver is the site the most affected in children and female genital organs are most affected in young adults. The imaging characteristics of extrarenal rhabdoid tumor are not yet to be determined. Recently, Gars, uh, Garces and uh, Anol demonstrate that these tumors have a tendency to be large and hypodense on CT scan and show a heterogeneous apparent on CT on situated magne uh, on magnetic resonance imaging. As I have already explained just before, hematoxidin and using staining of, uh, uh, of malignant rhabdoid tumor demonstrate sheets of uniform large epithelial weak cell with vesicular chromatin, proeminent nuclear, and eosinophilic cytoplasm. A subset of cells contain, contains yielding cytoplasmic inclusion that call rhabdoid inclusion. However, there is many variant graph patterns such, such as mixed with pattern, mixed yielding pattern, uh, alveolar, pseudo alveolar pattern, uh, fascicular or spandex cell pattern, uh, clear cell pattern, and and differentiate brown cell pattern. Histopathologically malignant rhabdoid tumor can be heterogeneous and must be differentiated from rhabdomyosarcoma, epithelial with sarcoma, Immune sarcoma, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, melanoma, and, and medulloblastoma, uh, uh, and colloid plexus carcinoma with uh, cases located on central nervous system. This table shows us the different antibodies used to differentiate malignant rhabdoid tumor from other differential di diagnoses. This panel is not exhaustive. The antibodies re request depend on the age of patient the location of the tumor and the morphological appearance in the hematoxidin using staining. Immunohistochemically malignant abdomen tumor display a complete loss of nuclear staining of uh, anyone. However, endothelial cells of the central blood vessel and scar uh, inflammatory and, and benign stromal cells retain their smart cb one staining and serve as internal control. The 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 vimontine, the cytokeratin, uh, and epithelial membrane antigen are deposited. This loss of expression of anyone is not specific for malignant rhabdoid tumors, and it's found in other rare tumors. It has been reported that aberrant expression can be classified into three patterns: complete loss patterns, mosaic expression, and reduced expression. The first picture shows us a case of malignant rhabdoid tumor with, uh, uh, with the non-nuclear expression of any one protein uh, observed in tumor cells. The second picture shows us a case of schwannomatosis with, uh, with, with, with any one with, with expression is focally reduced uh, with a mixture of nuclear positive and nuclear negative tumor cells showing mosaic pattern. And the last uh, case is of synovial sarcoma with reduced pattern positivity, which uh, uh, compared to uh, inflammatory cells uh, scarred between cells, uh, tumor cells. This table shows the, us the different uh, diagnostic, uh, different tumor, any one deficient. Uh, in the complete loose group, we, uh, we, found, we find malignant rhabdoid tumor, epithelial with sarcoma, renal medullary carcinoma, epithelial with epinist tumor, myoepithelial tumor, extraskeletal mixed with chondrosarcoma, pediatric chondroma, uh, pancreas, and, different, and differentiated rhabdoid carcinoma, 
sinonasal basal with carcinoma, rubbed with carcinoma of gastrointestinal tracts. And the mosaic expression group contains schwannomatosis, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, ossifying fibromyx with tumor. And the last group of reduced expression contains synovial, uh, synovial sarcoma. Regarding therapeutic options, there is no clear consensus, but complete surgical excision remains the treatment of choice whenever, whenever feasible. Otherwise, neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy often associated with radiation is done. Targeted therapy is under investigation using various epigenetic pathways, including DNA and histone methylation, histone uh, deacetylation, uh, cell cycle arrays, and anti-metotic mechanisms. Extrarenal uh, malignant rubbed with tumor demonstrates a rapidly progressive evolution with metastasis occurring in most patients from 2 to, uh, to, 50, to 50 months after diagnosis. It has a dismal prognosis and dependent from localization. Disseminated disease to the lungs, lymph nodes, and liver at the time of diagnosis is reported in the, in the literature. This occurs in uh, uh, 80 to uh, 90% of cases after an, av an, an average period of 5.5 months. To sum up, malignant trapped with tumor is a rare and an is a rare and aggressive tumor of your children. They should be included in the differential diagnosis of round cell tumor of children and, and talk about, uh, about it in front of any aggressive isolated tumor of children. The loss of the nuclear staining of anyone represents the case for the positive diagnosis in front of a rapid with morphology. It's a challenge diagnosis to pathologists, especially especially with teeny biopsy material or mineral rubbed with compo component, which requires multiplying additional sections. Malignant rubbed with tumor highlights difficulties in therapeutic decisions, a large, a large comparative study to open perspectives for new targeted therapies aimed to, con to controlling the inactivation of smart CB1 tumor gene suppressor. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Tahiri. Um, that was really a brilliant presentation and uh, very, very interesting to see these unusual cases. Um, so um, I'd just like to invite any um, questions um, from the audience. Uh, you could either send your questions to the chat or you could um, ask um, Professor Tahiri directly. There is no question on the chat box. There isn't any question. There is, of course, somebody who has said, well, it's not a question related to your, no, your it's talk. Not a question. But it, it says, dear friends, I'm Dr. Al Tekin from Turkey. I'm a lecturer at a private university in Istanbul and looking for preparing for associate professorship. And I'm looking for friends with whom we can work, share facts, and publish. So if anybody is interested, they could get in touch with uh, Dr. Elp Dickin. I'll just give another minute to see if there are any further questions or anyone is, um, has any questions. Okay. Looks like we don't have any questions from the audience. Thank you so much once again, uh, Professor Tahiri. That was very, very interesting. And um, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, we will see you back next year uh, to hear more from you. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. We probably will now move on to our next speaker for the for the morning. Um, it's uh, Dr. Zama Michali from South Africa. Um, and um, do we have Dr. Zama? Yes, we do. I'm not quite sure why my face is not showing. I think the <laughs> camera is not working here. Yeah. So um, I think we just have to work with the anonymity. Um, is that okay? Because I can't swap 
no that's no it's... no issues at all we can hear you very well so um yeah if if you're uh, happy to then you could actually go ahead and uh you know share your presentation and start off um, is there a way i can show you anything? thank you thank you so um thank you uh, very much for uh, having me and for giving me an opportunity to present an interesting short case report. And I've asked the team to share on my behalf. I don't know if they are able to, otherwise I can share from my screen. Um, give us a minute, please. Uh, let me check. Okay. okay so here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the presentation is based on an unexpected finding, um, which I saw on the prostate biopsy. Initially, I had received a bladder biopsy, and which was a core biopsy. And um, so I will just take you through that. And this is uh, quickly for those who haven't been to. Oh, we're gonna. I'm gonna have to rely on your end to to help with the scrolling. If we could just go to the next one. Okay, this is South Africa, Cape Town. For those of you who haven't visited South Africa, something to look forward to. And um, I'm based in Joburg. This is one of our uh, big cities in, jo in uh, South Africa. It's a lovely place to visit. So as we uh, move on to the third slide, um, the case presentation is of that of a 65 year old male patient um, who presented with a bladder mess, which was placed uh, or located at the dome of the bladder. There was no relevant medical history. And that's also one thing that I wanted to highlight about this presentation, just the importance of receiving thorough history uh, from our uh, urologist, uh, because this uh, case um, is, is, is one of those where you need to have uh, adequate medical history. So there was no medical history. We were just working in the dark when we received multiple fragments of tissue. And the diagnosis was made initially on the fragments, tiny fragments of tissue. And um, one particular immunohistochemical stain played a vital role in helping us arrive at a diagnosis. And we later on received a um, cysto, uh, prostatectomy. Um, if you could just move to number five slides. So this one was a, a, a bigger specimen which had both the bladder and the prostate submitted. And um, slide number five, please. Um, microscopically, we saw a very um, ugly looking neoplastic infiltrate which was uh, sprinkled. And of particular note is that in all the sections, both the, the fragmented sections, the tiny fragments, as well as the, uh, the, the, the entire bladder, we did not have the overlying dysplastic mucosa. So there was no uh, carcinoma inside you, but there was this infiltrative spingle cell neoplasm, highly pleomorphic cells had uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm and some of the cells had bizarre nuclear with um, uh, 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 abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm in areas. There was um, a vague wavy nuclear um, noted in some areas. There was brisk mitotic activity. Large areas of necrosis were seen and there was uh, no evidence of heterologous differentiation. And by that, I mean, there was no uh, osteosarcomatous elements, no chondroid elements and uh, no evidence of any pigmentation, no pools of mucin identified, no true glandular differentiation. And um, one interesting finding that we had, which um, uh, unfortunately I don't have a picture of, we had also Bilharzia, schistosomasis within the, the bladder tumor. So we therefore went ahead and did the immunohistochemical stains on slide six and the, the most, um, the, the, I wanna make a, a big noise on GATA3, uh, how it played a role in helping us arrive at the diagnosis, because as you can see, uh, if you're faced with a high grade malignant neoplasm spindle cell in the bladder, the diagnosis or the differential diagnosis can be quite wide and diverse. So there was positivity with AE1 and three, there was uh, no CK5 and six, 
staining, no CK20, P63 showed nuclear staining, the 34 beta E12 and CK7 were focally positive, and that was also a useful thing to have. Uh, the PEX8 was negative. And next slide. So uh, additional markers such as S100, HCAL Desmond, sorry, Desmond, and uh, CD34, as well as S100, I'm sorry, I repeated that by mistake, were negative. The HCAL Desmond and uh, Cal Desmond and the SMA, the actin markers for um, a sm smooth muscle differentiation showed positive staining. And um, this the next slide is the histological um, a picture of what we were dealing with. The tumor looked um, uh, monomorphic uh, throughout. And as you can see and appreciate, it's very high grade tumor. You can appreciate from this uh, uh, end that there is an infiltration into the uh, smooth muscle tumors sort of in the, into the smooth muscle bundles. And um, also one other interesting thing was, uh, I don't know if you can see that from here, where these uh, pseudovascular structures, they were ectatic structures with uh, that, that almost look, wanted to look like pseudoglandular, but without the um, lining epithelium around them. And um, so the other uh, structures are showing bizarre looking uh, nuclear. And then um, the other immunos, uh, represented on slide number nine, um, further confirming what I had alluded to on the previous slides. This is the AE1 and 3, which is showing a nicely um, staining, which is diffuse. GATA3 was um, a deal breaker for us, and it's showing some uh, um, moderate staining, which was also diffuse, and that was quite reassuring. In the next slide, um, this is now on the, the, the bigger specimen that we received. Um, so much to my amazement, I discovered that there was an additional tumor. So in other words, we had dual pathology. So slide number 11 is uh, showing an infiltrative focus of an asina adenocarcinoma. This was from the prostate and it is showing a lack of the basal cell lining around them. And you can see that there's already smooth muscle cutting uh, from low power and there is no uh, uh, additional basal cell lining, um, which can be noted um, on morphology. I therefore went ahead and did the basal cell marker and the, sorry, I didn't label uh, slide number 12. I didn't label that one, but I did the the, the 34 beta E12, which is um, a, a marker for basal cells, and it's showing a negative staining. Um, you can appreciate that it's brown on the uh, surrounding normal uh, structures. And then where the neoplasm is, you can see that it's lacking. There was no perineural infiltration and no pin represented in the sections examined. So the diagnosis um, on the slide number 13, please that we assigned to this patient. Uh, the 65 year old African man was there of a sarcomatoid urothelial carcinoma with a coexisting prostate carcinoma. Just a quick um, discussion on these two tumors. Obviously these are uh, very broad topics to cover and I will not be uh, going through each component. It's just to bring in an, an awareness of dual pathology. So on the next slide, the suka, I've just called it a suka, it's just a sarcomatoid uro, a variant of a urothelial carcinoma. It's a rare variant of urothelial carcinoma and it accounts for uh, up to 0.3% of all urothelial carcinomas of the blood. Often affects um, elderly male patients and um, it's um, reported to be associated with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. So already you can see that it's very important for us to get a thorough or comprehensive clinical history from our urologist. And the other risk factors that are associated with this tumor is um, a previous urothelial carcinoma, tobacco smoking, recurrent cystitis, diabetes, neurogenic bladder, and bladder diverticulum. So the next slide, uh, number 15, is just a recap on just the importance of being able to assign a variant to uh, the urothelial carcinoma. It's a very exhaustive uh, list of variants that you one gets in the urothelial carcinomas. And I took this from a journal 
And it's just a summarized view. And I know that there are some variants that are missing. It's just a summarized view of variants of the urothelial carcinoma, where you get squamous differentiation, glandular differentiation, micropapillary, those ones do badly. And so it's very important to recognize them and they can stand with CFB2. So it's important to, 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 to note the micropapillary variant. Sarcomatoid, which is what I'm talking about, is also an, an important variant. Um, and not to confuse this one with the carcinos, uh, carcinosarcoma, they are two, two different entities. So that's also important to remember. And there's also uh, the neuroendocrine, the plasma cytoid can look alarming. Um, and it, it can almost look like the, the invasive lobular carcinoma of the breast. So um, always be careful because the, the, uh, that will stain with the GATA3 as well. And the nested variant, and there are many others. So next slide, the sarcomatoid variant um, of uh, urothelial carcinoma uh, is characterized um, by the presence of areas um, that are indistinguishable from the sarcoma and one can get the heterologous components uh, such as osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and angiosarcoma. And it's very important to, uh, to, 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 to be able to note the presence of the heterologous components because uh, they impact on the uh, adverse behavior. So uh, one must be on the lookout for, for, for such. And um, the squamous and glandular differentiation um, of the urothelial carcinomas, they don't have any effect on prognosis. Um, while, as I said, the micropapillary sarcomatoid, plasma cytoid, and small cell carcinomas have been implicated in the adverse outcome or the poor prognosis of this tumor. Now, what is the differential diagnosis when you have this single cell lesion? Um, if we could go to the next slide. So, you have spingle cell uh, neoplastic infiltrates in the bladder. What are the things that you need to uh, rule out as a pathologist? Um, so firstly, you depending on the level of uh, pleomorphism, but uh, certainly one needs to have the benign myofibroblastic proliferation in the differential. And those would include things like post-operative spingle cell nodules, as well as the IMT, the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors. Um, those can mimic the sarcomatoid carcinoma. Uh, also uh, on the malignant end, leiomyosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and angiosarcoma, as well as the spingle cell malignant melanoma, uh, those would be also in your differential diagnosis. And the role of the immunohistochemical stain is, uh, is very critical and pivotal uh, in arriving at the accurate diagnosis. And uh, there is a paper that uh, um, is written that speaks of the, the markers that are very uh, critical in, um, in, in, in that one must do in um, diagnosing espongosal neoplasm. And I will come to that shortly, but the P63 certainly, the GATA3 and the high molecular weight um, needs to be included. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the workup um, of espongosal proliferation. Um, the panel that one needs to have. So also um, I wanted to highlight that if you have a limited biopsy like I had initially, it is very, very difficult to, 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 to assign an accurate diagnosis without doing the markers, but one needs to have a high level of uh, or, or high index of suspicion for the sarcomatoid um, uh, tumor. Uh, so that one can be informed on what immunos to do. So the six top most markers to do is the ALK1. Um, obviously, we had the IMT in the differential, the SMA, Desmin, cytokeratins, P63, um, as well as the high molecular weight cytokeratins. So those are, are, are very critical. So in, in, in our case, really, GAT3 played a very critical role in pointing us to the right uh, direction in, in, uh, in as far as the bladder origin is concerned. So GATA3 uh, GATA is a member of a, a family of a, a six zinc finger transcription factor, and it's, it's expressed in up to 90% of urothelial carcinoma. However, just like every other thing in pathology, you need to know what else can it stain. So we know that it stains the ductal carcinoma of the breast, and uh, up to 100% of lobular carcinoma. So the plasma cytoid variant of the urothelial carcinoma, um, if you have that and you see a GATA3 that's positive, you need to know 
that um, there the, 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 the could be a possibility of breast origin and you need to do more markers to rule that out. So um, also GATA3, it has been um, reported in cutaneous basal cell carcinomas, the trophoblastic and yolk sac uh, tumors, the SCCs, the mesotheliomas, the salivary glands, pancreatic ductal carcinoma, and the endometrial adenocarcinoma. Um, so the paragangliomas also are commonly encountered in the bladder, and these can also stain. Next one, please. So when you are faced with this, your differential, is it, is it a primary lesion or is it a secondary involvement? So the secondary involvement of bladder by uh, the tumors um, uh, from other sides can occur either by direct extension or by meds. Um, and it accounts for 2.3% of surgical bladder tumor specimens. So the direct extension from um, the, 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 the sites would include like um, uh, prostates. Um, so you need to rule out a prostate, uh, prosthetic neoplasm, the colorectals, the cervical carcinomas. Um, the hematogenous meds uh, frequently occur from stomach, melanomas, lung, breast, kidneys, so uh, once again, the immunohistochemical panel that you do plays a very, very critical role as well as the clinical history. Next slide, please. Uh, just a brief um, uh, uh, molecular um, mention uh, regarding the prostate cancers. Um, so I'm quite passionate with the subject. Um, because um, it has been discovered that the uh, prostate cancer in men of African descent tends to present at a late stage and it has a high lethality and it's got a peculiar genomic uh, e e event picture and it's one of those understudied uh, e e areas. So my, my, my focus also is on these, and that's why I have to, I'm just highlighting a little bit on the molecular aspect of prostates. So the men of African uh, ancestry have a higher prostate cancer incidence and a higher lethality than those of European ancestry. And the factors behind this, um, this disparity are, are quite vast, other than the, 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 the resources and, and, and everything, but genes play a vital role. And previously, family history used to be um, uh, ranked amongst the topmost risk factors um, for patients that um, have prostate cancers, but it has been discovered that uh, it's no longer the most useful gauge for the risk um, because 60% of men with uh, identifiable gen line mutation of BRCA2, ATM, and BRCA1 uh, uh, did not have any family history of prostate cancer. So there's another molecular event that one needs to be mindful of, the BRCA2, BRCA1, and the ATM, um, which um, will affect the younger uh, males um, with prostate cancer with an African um, uh, descent. So the, 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 the prostate cancer patients with inherited mutations of BRCA1 and 2 and ATM are more likely to die of prostate cancer, and they do so at an early stage. And the prostate cancer in black men uh, contain fewer TMPRSS2, uh, ERG fusions, and P10 deletions, and the higher incident of the SPOP mutations than uh, do those of men in, um, uh, from European descent. So those are just the molecular highlights regarding the prostate cancer because um, it's something that is very common in our setting and we're trying to find out what the genomic events are. So it's also useful to know what are the key uh, um, role players in, in the development of cancer. So what is the take home message for these short case reports? If you could just go to the next slide. Number one is a pathologist beware of dual pathology. So things are not always straightforward. You need to have a high index of suspicion, especially um, marrying that with the context of uh, the where you are. In my case, in South Africa, we see a lot of prostate. So you must always, um, even though you have a bladder cancer you're dealing with, you must always be suspicious of a, po a potential or possible unexpected prostate cancer. And then the immunohistochemical markers that support the urothelial lineage include P63, GATA3, High molecular weight cytokeratins, those are very, very important uh, for you 
to 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 include in your in your in your spinal cell lesions. And the GATA three, obviously, like I've said, it, it's very very important. The six immunohistochemical uh, panel for spinal cell proliferation in the bladder. Um, and if you have a limited specimen, make sure that you include your GATA three alkan, the actin uh, markers for um. For, for, for smooth muscle, um, SMA, desmin, cytokeratins, P and P63, uh, as well as high molecular weight cytokeratins. So make sure that you include the six um, panel uh, if you have a limited biopsy that you're working with and you'll be able to arrive at an accurate diagnosis. And uh, also the uh, another thing that one needs to um, uh, keep abreast with is the familiarity with the histological variants of the urothelial carcinomas. That's very important. Uh, for both pathologists and clinicians to facilitate appropriate diagnosis and management of these patients because the, their management differs based on the variants that one is dealing with. And then uh, lastly, mutation status of BRCA1 and, and 2 and ATM distinguishes risk for lethal and indolent prostate cancer and is associated with an earlier age uh, at death and a shorter survival time. Thank you. I think that to be my last slide. Um, I'm going to uh, pause now and take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, that was extremely exciting and very interesting um, to see your, you know, the dual tumor with the sarcomatoid. Uh, urothelial along with the uh, prostatic adenocarcinoma that was very interesting and a very beautiful area of immunohistic chemistry panel and very nicely presented. Thank you so much. I'm just going to see if there are any questions um, for your presentation. So there is one question that's come up. Do you routinely use GATA3 immunohistochemical marker for bladder? Yes, we do. Thank you. I think as you rightly said, um, Dr. Michali, I think it's one of the more useful markers, isn't it, to, to confirm um, urinary histology and uh, urinary origin of UC. Yeah, because we don't have the uroplakin and the, the nicer ones, so we're, we depend um, heavily on the GATSA3. It's nice and clean, it's nuclear. It's um, a useful marker. Yep, we use it as well quite frequently. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. Um, I, while we're waiting for the audience to, to, for a question from the audience, perhaps I could ask a question. Um, in your experience uh, with um, you know, prostatic adenocarcinomas, have you come across any cases of uh, treatment emergent neuroendocrine carcinoma in the prostate, you know, like probably castration resistant um, metastatic deposits that you find is going to be, are turning out to be not a adenocarcinoma, but a you know, neuroendocrine small cell carcinoma, have you come across this in your practice? Um, yes, we do have uh, neuroendocrine uh, carcinomas. We see a lot of uh, cores. We hardly see um, radical prostatectomies. So um, if you're dealing with a core, obviously you're limited to a, a, a workup up to a certain point. So we'll do a synaptophysin chromogranin and we work on morphology. But we, now and then we, we, we do encounter those um, um, neuroendocrine, and they do badly, and um, yeah. something that one needs to um, um, put um, in the in the report and make sure that you include it. I think in some one has also been more recently found to be a very useful marker in the neuroendocrine setting, isn't it? Yes. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? I don't see anything further. Thank you so much, Dr. Michelle. Unfortunately, we are not able to see you, but uh, it was a very, very interesting um, talk and very nicely presented. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sitra. We'll now move on to our next speaker for the day. Uh, it's Dr. Rajiv Tangri from India. So over to yourself, Dr. Tangri. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'll now share my screen.
I hope my screen is visible. Yes, we can see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to present uh, at this conference. I am Dr. Rajiv Tamri, uh, Technical Director for Histopathology and Cytopathology, uh, Dr. Lal Path Labs, uh, which is the largest chain of diagnostic laboratories uh, in, in India. So uh, the, my topic uh, uh, today would be reporting of breast biomarkers using AI-based algorithms. Uh, so I'll be presenting uh, our experience of how we uh, implemented this in our setup. So uh, I'll start with a brief introduction of uh, digital pathology. Uh, we all know that uh, digital revolution has now taken a center stage in uh, both clinical medicine as well as in biomedical research. Uh, digital telemedicine, radiology, cardiology, uh, they all uh, have replaced traditional subjective diagnostic modalities. Uh, histopathology, which is traditionally the interpretation of disease patterns under a microscope, uh, until very recently uh, was, uh, we were using the traditional microscopes only. Uh, and recently only it has begun to embrace this digital revolution. For more than 150 years since the time of virtue, uh, the pathology uh, was a diagnosis of disease based on the subjective interpretation of glass slides, which had uh, tissue on it. Uh, the visual patterns were uh, seen and identification was made manually under a microscope. Uh, now, since the interpretation of these patterns, uh, which uh, ultimately lead to a uh, diagnosis is uh, subjective and there can be a lot of inter-observer and intra-observer variabilities plus uh, a component of fatigue variability. Uh, it can confound accurate diagnostic interpretation of the disease. So uh, now uh, the new developments of whole slide imaging, the digital pathology, uh, the epithelial recognition algorithms and specific uh, recognition algorithms, uh, which can identify and uh, very accurately quantify the immunohistochemical staining patterns, the, the tissue uh, patterns uh, and uh, arrangements. Uh, and specific histological features has significantly catalyzed the, prog the progress and wider acceptance of digital pathology. Uh, talking about the artificial intelligence, uh, which is said to be the third revolution in pathology, uh, the earlier ones being immunohistochemistry and uh, genomics. So uh, uh, there is uh, there's a wide range of what artificial intelligence can help in, in pathology, particularly histopathology, uh, right from uh, diagnosing a disease to predicting recurrence of disease, uh, predicting genetic alterations, uh, muta uh, mutations at, at DNA RNA level, and even predicting prognosis of the disease. So uh, now uh, what uh, we could see under a microscope on a slide, the machine can see much more uh, thanks to this uh, digital revolution. Uh, apart from the structural changes, the machine can also, uh, as I said, already predict the prognosis, the driver mutations can be predicted, uh, the, 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 or the tumor of region, the organ of region of the tumor can be predicted. And even the uh, quantification of, uh, of, of various uh, biomarkers can be predicted based on just examination of uh, HND stained slides under these uh, uh, scanners and using these algorithms, AI based algorithms. Uh, coming to uh, our uh, my today's topic of breast biomarkers. Now, uh, Breast uh, cancer, we all know, is a leading cause of cancer death in females, and the, uh, the, the rate incidence has significantly increased now, thanks to the high life expectancy and a lot of uh, environmental and genetic factors compounded. Uh, now, uh, treatment as well as prognostication of breast cancer is largely dependent on report of uh, four biomarkers, which are estrogen receptor, 
progesterone receptor HER2 and KI67. Uh, ER and PR expression helps not only in prognostication, but also helps in deciding uh, the patients who will respond to hormonal therapies like tamoxifen. Uh, while HER2 amplification helps us in identifying patients who are uh, target for anti-HER2 uh, or Herceptin target therapy uh, patients. So uh, now uh, various uh, guidelines, including the very prestigious ESCO and CAP guidelines now recommend that 100% of the cases who have been diagnosed either primarily as breast cancer or, or as metastatic or recurrent breast cancers must undergo uh, her ER, PR, HER2 and uh, HER2 status determination. And some of the recommendations also add KI67 to it. Uh, we all know that traditionally these reports are quantitative and even minor differences, especially in the borderline cases, can make significant difference in treatment decisions. Uh, I'm quoting some of the references here. Uh, this is from a, a consensus statement from the Spanish Society of Medical Oncology and Pathology, who say that uh, conventionally all the cases should have ER, PR, HER2, and K67, apart from histological grade in the histopathology report. Uh, these are the latest NCCN guidelines, which also mention uh, that ER and PR should be performed on all new or newly metastatic breast cancers. Uh, the same is uh, they have mentioned for HER2, uh, which also should be done on all the new cases uh, or new metastatic cases. Uh, there are some guidelines on inclusion of KI67 also by NCCN in a subset of patients. So uh, this is also important. Uh, now, based on uh, the results of these biomarkers, the breast cancer is also categorized into uh, three uh, sub types which are now called molecular classification of uh, breast carcinoma. Uh, these are hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative patients, which constitute the 70% largest sub subset, that is 70% of patients. Uh, HER2 positive patients, irrespective of uh, ER, uh, ERPR status, uh, and the triple negative patients, which uh, uh, constitute the smallest subset of around 15% of the patients. Now, all these three uh, subsets, or actually rather four, luminal A, B, HER2 positive, and T and BC, uh, we can see from this uh, graph that they have, uh, they have different lines of treatment. They are, yeah. so uh, the luminal A, uh, as we move from luminal A toward T and BC, uh, the treatment options change from endocrine therapy to chemotherapy completely, and the prognosis goes from very good prognosis to very poor prognosis. Uh, so uh, it is important that very accurate reports of ERPR, HER2, and K67 is uh, rendered to the patients, and uh, that will help clinicians in accurately deciding the treatment options. Uh, we all know in current practice, the biomarkers are typically determined uh, by visual inspection of uh, IHC stained slides uh, under a microscope. And uh, uh, it's, it's not actually accurate, very accurate counting of the cells. There are some uh, scores like uh, H score, all red score, they are available for ERPR reporting. But then uh, they are all uh, semi quantitative and they are also very subjective. Uh, Despite the evaluation of these slides by very highly trained expert pathologists, uh, there, is, there are some limitations uh, resulting from human bias, inter-observer, intra-observer variability, and a poor resolution of the dynamic range of signal intensity, especially uh, uh, towards the lower end of uh, spectrum of detection. So all this results in uh, some subjectivity of reporting of these biomarker results, which are quantitative and as we saw, very important in uh, deciding the, uh, the treatment options for the patients. So uh, what AI-based platforms have done, they have now overcome this subjectivity and uh, they allow a very accurate quantification 
uh, of uh, results by tumor uh, computer assisted image analysis. Uh, the tools help pathologists in providing a very accurate, objective, and reproducible assessment of the breast biomarkers. And uh, it, it has also been demonstrated in various studies that uh, this computer assisted uh, image analysis can help in actually reducing. HER2 IC equivocal results. And uh, we will see uh, uh, our data in a bit. So, uh, talking about our laboratory, Dr. Lal Path Labs, uh, as I said earlier, it's the largest chain of uh, patho pathology laboratory in the country. And histopathology laboratory at Dr. Lal Path Labs is also also a very high volume private laboratory uh, and uh, is also the largest histopathology uh, single site setup uh, not only in the country but in Asia and uh, on this part of the world. Uh, our annual workload in uh, last year was uh, 264,000 cases which included 190,000 cases of histopathology uh, which uh, translates into uh, 597,000 blocks and slides, uh, plus 73,000 odd uh, cytopathology cases. Uh, we uh, moved from uh, the routine manual pathology to digital pathology. Our journey started in 2018. And uh, this is how uh, our journey progressed. Uh, so we acquired the whole slide scanner uh, in June 2018. Uh, the initial uh, couple of months went into assessment of IT requirements, vendor negotiations, uh, and uh, initiation of the processes. Now, uh, I will cover in my subsequent slides that there were some challenges which required a lot of inputs and uh, coordination uh, between the technical laboratory team, the technicians, the doctors, uh, with the IT team of the laboratory and uh, the external vendors, IMS vendors and uh, uh, LIMS vendors. Uh, so uh, ultimately in September 2018, uh, we started the integration uh, of IMS, uh, image management system of, uh, of the scanner with star LIMS. Uh, and uh, once this was done, this, uh, I mean, as I said, there were a lot of uh, uh, steps involved, a lot of coordination involved, and it took uh, all, more than six months of time. So we were ready by March and April of the next year, that is 2019, when the training of pathologists was started. Uh, immediately after that, we uh, valid did validation for the pathologists. And uh, we started reporting routine histopathology in, the, in April 2019. Uh, we acquired our first AI-based algorithm uh, in the same year, uh, year end, in December 2019, when the Visual Farm software for breast biomarkers was, was installed. Uh, there was a, a lag phase of about three, four months after that because uh, the, the, the software required calibration uh, as well as validation. Uh, I will cover these two steps uh, in later slides. Uh, and by May 2020, we were actually ready uh, to roll out these algorithm-based results to the market. So our first result was reported out in May 2020. And uh, within a month or so, uh, we were reporting 100% of our breast biomarkers uh, using these AI-based softwares. Uh, so we didn't stop there. Uh, we uh, we ne started negotiating for further AI-based reporting. And uh, presently, uh, we are proud to have uh, another AI-based algorithm available with us, which is a IBEX uh, trust biopsy prostate algorithm, which was installed uh, in December last year, this 2021. And uh, further going ahead, we are also now working on acquiring some more algorithms like uh, best diagnostic algorithms, the PDL1 algorithms, and few more. Uh, so, so this is the hardware and the software that we acquired. Uh, we, uh, we acquired Physips ultra fast uh, 300 scanner, which had a capacity of scanning 300 slides uh, at, at a speed of around uh, 
two minutes per slide on an average, depending on the size of the uh, section. Uh, so it was accompanied by the Philips IntelliSight pathology solution, the image management system, and the VisioFarm uh, AI algorithm apps, which were for ERPR2 and uh, K67. Uh, so uh, the, the, the workflow uh, was uh, very simple. Uh, the slide preparation was, uh, was happening the way it was being done earlier, staining for ERPR had been K67. We already had automated stainers from uh, Deco, Ventana, as well as Leica. Uh, so we used uh, Deco stainers, uh, Deco link. 48 for staining of ER and PR uh, and for HER2 and K67 we used Pencha, uh, Ventana Benchmark XT. Uh, so once the slides were ready, uh, slide scanning was done using the Philips scanner. The cases were uploaded in LIMS and were assigned to the pathologist. Uh, AI algorithms were applied and a review by the pathologist was done and this was followed by report documentation. So it looks very simple on this uh, on this slide, but actually there were a lot of complications, a lot of uh, coordination, a lot of uh, uh, calibrations, validations required uh, to and fro to ensure that the documentation and re report release happened in the initial phase. Uh, these are the staining protocols, uh, just for reference that we use. As I said, for ERPR, we used DECO. And for her twin K67, we used uh, Ventana auto stainers. Uh, so, as I said earlier, implementation and complete switchover from manual reporting to AI based reporting was uh, not a uh, smooth road. It was a rocky uh, road full of multiple challenges. The biggest one uh, being uh, technophobia, the fear amongst the pathologists uh, who were used to reporting on uh, micro, under a microscope for, for years together. So uh, suddenly they were told to report on AI-based algorithms on the computer screens. So uh, there, was a, uh, there was a definite, uh, definite hesitance there, but that disappeared very soon as soon as uh, they realized the, the, the advantages. Uh, of course, there was a high deployment cost of hardware as well as the data storage cost of this uh, uh, which was also very high because uh, each slide the, the the size of the slide is huge i mean maybe uh, maybe up to 2 gb for each slide uh, very good data transfer speed was required to ensure that there was no lag in reporting these cases and of course uh, the workflow needs to be integrated seamlessly bidirectionally with the lab information management system. So uh, all this required a very, uh, uh, required an excellent support from the management, which fortunately uh, we, we got uh, and very timely support we got uh, and great coordination was required between the laboratory technical team, IT team and the IMS vendors. Uh, still, uh, I would like to uh, put up here some of the challenges and how we mitigated those challenges uh, on our road to uh, digital pathology and uh, AI-based reporting of breast biomarkers. Uh, the LIMS integration was on the top, uh, the barcodes that were generated using Ventana and uh, Deco, they were not uh, compatible with, uh, they were not compatible with LIMS. So in each, uh, earlier we were reporting manually only, so this was not required. But since we were using now WS size or whole slide images, so uh, there was a requirement that uh, these slides are scanned and uploaded into LIMS directly. So uh, we had to replace our barcodes, which was a lot I mean, from simple barcodes that we were using earlier to uh, two D barcodes, barcode labels. This was changed. We acquired, I mean, our IT team helped a lot in doing this. And this ensured that uh, uh, the information flowed seamlessly between LIMS and IMS. Uh, IT also helped us in creating a tab on the LIMS page uh, reporting page for direct access to the scanned images. So uh, this is how the, the barcodes looked earlier. This was this is a barcode from Baco, and this is the 2D, 2D barcode which was compatible with LIMS as well as it was working on the uh, 
the name Intana or Depo. And uh, uh, this is our LIMS uh, reporting page, wherein this view slide option was uh, given, this button was given by IT, so that we don't have to toggle between different screens between uh, between uh, our limbs and the Philips IMS screen while we were reporting these digital cases. Uh, another problem that we uh, encountered initially was no scanning. Uh, there were many cases, especially uh, when uh, the cases were like ERPR or two negatives, uh, we found that they were not being scanned by the scanner. So uh, we realized that this was because uh, we were used to uh, slightly weak hematoxylin counter staining in our slides. Uh, so, uh, and that we were doing uh, for many years, but then uh, the scanner was not recognizing, not identifying those slides. So uh, what we had to do that uh, we had to slightly increase the intensity of hematoxylin counter staining and uh, that helped, helped us in easily resolving the issue. Uh, out of focus slides, uh, because sometimes we were used to uh, putting markers uh, markers on the on the slide uh, to uh, to mark out the controls to mark out the uh, different areas of the case of the slide. So uh, such slides would very frequently go out of focus because the scanner was not able to differentiate between the two and the markers were usually uh, dark markers. So uh, it would focus more on the marker and less on the uh, section. So uh, we had to avoid using the markers on the slides. Uh, that delays was also one of the problems or the challenges that we initially encountered. Uh, so scanning was actually an additional step. Earlier, as soon as the slides were ready, uh, they would be put up to the, to the doctors. Now scanning was an additional step. And uh, being a very large volume laboratory, uh, uh, our, as I shared earlier also, our daily load is uh, to the tune of uh, 2,500 to 3,000 slides. And uh, for IHCs also, the workload is 400 to 500 slides every day. So uh, I mean, scanning all these slides took time and this was leading to delay in uh, turnaround time of the cases, to delay in reporting these cases. So what we had to do uh, and which helped us in successfully mitigating this was that uh, from being a 12 hour laboratory, earlier we were working uh, eight to eight, uh, or eight to nine most uh, in some uh, on some days we shifted to 24 7 laboratory and we started working at night so as soon as the slides were ready uh, we we changed our workflow in such a way that slides were ready by afternoon or evening they would be scanned throughout the night and next day the slides would be there on the computer screens of uh, uh, of, of the pathologist so this helped that helped us in mitigating this that delay issues uh, scanning errors are very, very common, though we were lucky enough to uh, have good validation and calibrations done in the initial phase with help from our IT team and as well as uh, the team from uh, from the scanning uh, vendor that is Philips. So uh, our out of focus cases were less than 2% uh, most, uh, most of the times. Uh, so uh, the errors that usually were encountered were out of the focus sections, vertical bands, uh, air bubbles interfering with the slides. Uh, and sometimes uh, the robotic arm uh, that would move the slide uh, in the scanner uh, was unable to pick the slide from its rack or it was unable to put it back in the rack, uh, which, lead, which led to stuck robotic arm and the scanner would stop working. So uh, we realized that uh, this was because uh, of some errors during mounting or during section cutting, section thickness. So we had to alter some section thickness. Uh, while all the other issues, that is air bubbles and uh, slides getting stuck, they were uh, removed once we switched over from manual uh, mounting of slides to automated cover slippers. Uh, which we had acquired a little uh, earlier only, but uh, our technical staff was not very uh, comfortable switching from, uh, I mean, that was the reluctance. They thought that they were faster than the cover, automated cover slipper. But then uh, 
for for the scanner we started cover slipping everything by uh, by the automated cover slippers and that completely eliminated this uh, error the scanning error so we acquired this leica uh, stainer plus cover slipper uh, now uh, coming to the next step which was uh, calibration required for the algorithms now though the cali the algorithms were ce and ivd approved uh, the calibration was required uh, so to ensure that the app performed as expected and uh, it was tuned to handle the staining protocols and the scanner that we were using at our laboratory so uh, we followed the protocols given to us by uh, visiofarm and philips uh, a minimum of three data set point uh, for each of negative, weak, positive, and positive were used for uh, uh, ERPRK67, while uh, 15 data points were used for calibration of uh, R2, and these data points from different tissue sections. Uh, the, the slides uh, were scanned, annotation was done, uh, and manual scoring was done on the annotated areas for each case and same was sent to a visio form along with annotated full slide images. Uh, and the data analysis was performed by visio form and uh, finally the complete calibration of the app algorithms was done uh, for our scanner and for our uh, staining quality and so these are the, the i won't go into the details but these are the calibration reports calibration evaluation which which was successful and it was done uh, thoroughly uh now the next step was uh validation now validation we followed the cap guidelines which says that for uh, for routine uh, histopathology you should take 60 cases and for any additional modality you must take at least 20 cases so we took a minimum of 20 cases for each of erpr to 8 k67 and this was for each user so uh, our laboratory uh, presently have 21 users uh, in house and uh, this calibration validation was done for each of these 21 users. Uh, we uh, again followed the guidelines from Philips and Visioform to annotate and score these cases. Uh, manual scoring was done. Uh, in parallel, digital scoring was done using the app algorithms and the data was compared. Uh, we achieved a concordance of more than 95% for each of these biomarkers for all our users. Uh, this is an uh, example of data for one of the users, wherein we took 22 cases and uh, they were reported on glass slides, they were also reported on digital images, and the data was compared. Uh, very quickly about the work process flow, though, though this has been covered by uh, other presenters since yesterday. So uh, the, the algorithm uses uh, ROI identification, we have to mark out the ROIs. Uh, so regions of interest are selected manually uh, this, on the stained slides and these are then uh, submitted to VisioFarm app and within a few seconds we will get the results in a separate box and just uh, magnified the box for better visibility and it will, it will give the total number of nuclei counted uh, so this was just for the presentation just to put in the presentation but usually uh, uh, thousands of uh, more than 10,000 usually uh, is the recommendation that we have internally that more than 10,000 nuclei should be counted for each case it gives the accurate percentage of positive nuclei uh, this is for her to uh, wherein it gives the score uh, of her to between 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus. So, uh, this is the data uh, of all our cases that we reported using uh, artificial intelligence based algorithms that is the visio farm uh, ever since uh, it started in may 2020 so uh, till uh, last month we have reported 3573 cases which is uh, a, a very large number uh, as to say uh, and uh, this is the complete data uh, of positivity and negativity and uh, 
this matches with the with with uh, more or less with the cap cap requirements of positivity and negativity. So uh, thirty percent of our cases we found were triple negative. So uh, what were the advantages that we encountered in our setup? One was definitely a very uh, highly improved accuracy uh, and very high reproducibility of results. So the subjective errors were removed and uh, uh, the accuracy and reproducibility was very high. Uh, we actually encountered that the number of equivocal HER2 cases that required fish confirmation reduced. Uh, so I can go back to our results. You can see that percent equivocal from 7.2% in 2020 when we, we started this uh, went down to 5.8% in 2022. So this was a significant reduction in equivocal cases and uh, an indirect cost impact uh, on the patient. Uh, so all this resulted in a very high confidence level of the pathologist as well as for the clinicians uh, who were ultimately using these results. So, so uh, I would like to conclude here uh, by a few statements. Uh, AI-based quantitative image analysis is an indispensable tool increasingly being adopted in clinical settings. Uh, these tools help in producing faster, more accurate, and highly reproducible results, thus boosting the confidence of reporting pathologists as well as oncologists. Implementation of these tools in a large private laboratory setup will entail several workflow changes, which needs an excellent coordination between laboratory technical staff, IT teams, as well as the IMS vendors. Uh, calibration of AI tools must be thorough to ensure that it performs as expected and is tuned to handle the staining protocols and the scanner, which is used at the laboratory. Validation is crucial and must be taken individually for each user. CAP recommendations for in this regard are very helpful. So uh, just to uh, underline uh, underlying statement, overall benefits eventually overshadow the challenges of implementation and the high initial cost of deployment. So thank you. Uh, this is the laboratory where I work. This is our reference lab which is, uh, as I said, the largest uh, reference laboratory in the country. Uh, this is uh, at New Delhi in, in, in India. So, uh, and 90% of our histopathology work is being done from this laboratory. So thank you very much. Uh, I would be happy to take up if there are any questions. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Tangri. That was extremely brilliant presentation. I know we had a flavor of, um, you know, what your labs are uh, doing in terms of digital pathology from Dr. Nakra yesterday. So, you know, it was a very nice segue into your talk today, uh, which is providing more insight into the uh, AI module that you have used for breast cancers. I think it was um, really, really very interesting. We do have one question from the audience to say, where could we obtain the record of this session? Um, I'm not too sure if you have an answer for that. Perhaps some. Um... Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, does that mean the recording of the session? I would think so. Yeah, I I, I think so. I think that that uh, the organizers would be able to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that. I would have. We would have to defer to the organizer, organizing committee to confirm how we could uh, have access to the recordings. Right. Um, I do have just one or two questions about her too, particularly. It was interesting to see um, how, you know, you said there was a decline in the her two two plus cases. Right. Um, sorry, um, before I ask my question, the, the uh, conference committee has said they could find the recording, the recorded session on YouTube on the 16th of May. 2022. So those who are interested can actually go in and, and uh, see the recorded sessions. Thank you. Um, so the question I had was, you said there was a decline in the HER2 2 plus positive cases right. um, in your lab once you established with your farm. Uh, could, I say, could you comment if the decline you saw was, uh, did you see more cases moving from a 2 plus to a 1 plus or was it a 2 plus to a 3 plus? Uh, 
you know, the, the more challenging ones are the ones which are low two plus versus a high two plus, yeah. you know, that's the, those are the places where it's really challenging to say, would yes. it go into a, a straight three and say it's positive or it should become a one and it should be negative, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. where I think most of us struggle. Uh, so I think uh, it was uh, lower two plus, which, which actually improved because the cases that were uh, on the borderline between one plus and two plus, because uh, those between two plus and three plus, usually uh, human eye is also as uh, an experienced doctor, the pathologist, we are able to differentiate. But then uh, those lower two plus and one plus, uh, those were the cases which actually moved on uh, to one plus side. That's great, thank you. And did you have any correlation with the clinical outcome in these patients where the given other types of treatment and they be responded better. So, you know, you're saying from a clinical efficacy perspective, you did see some value in this, you know, in an improvement in the diagnosis as well. Uh, not many cases. Being a reference laboratory, we get uh, cases from okay. uh, across the country. But then we have uh, direct tie-ups with certain hospitals from there. We do get the feedback. And this was positive. Uh, plus, uh, we do perform her to by fish in our laboratory. So uh, there was a good correlation uh, between these cases also. That's great. I think it makes it even more important as we go down um, with the more recent uh, you know, importance around the HER2 low cases that we are seeing there is an importance um, of identifying these low cases. And I think, as you rightly said, the use of AI is certainly going to help us improve, you know, those HER2 low of one plus or even low cases that we want to do moving forward um, into the current era. Thank you so much, Dr. Tangri. I'm not seeing any further questions. Uh, that was really a very nice presentation and thank you. We really enjoyed it. Uh, we'll uh, yeah, probably... Yeah, if you, if you have time, then can I ask uh, one question with uh, Dr. Rajiv? Yes, please. Please go on. Yeah, Dr. Rajiv, a uh, very nice uh, speech. Uh, I'm Dr. Dilip uh, from Eliprasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. Hi, Yeah, so my question is that I'm also using a uh, uh, digital scanner. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we are trying to look uh, that uh, without immunostochemistry uh, by using AI uh, to the benign condition and uh, uh, malignant on histopathology, uh, hematoxin mm -hmm. eosin stain. Mm -hmm. Are you looking on that? Uh, so presently, we are not uh, into, uh, into developing the algorithms ourselves, though uh, we, we have uh, discussions, we had past discussions also. Now also we are talking to some of the software developers, uh, wherein uh, we would be developing our own algorithms along with them. But as of now, uh, we are using only the uh, commercially available algorithms which are CEIBD approved. So we, we have not developed algorithms so far. So I, I hope that was the question. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm saying that uh, if there is any tools or method, so that mm -hmm. we can able to uh, use uh, to identify in Duncan or... Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. So, uh, so all, all we need is uh, to, uh, to stimulate machine learning. I mean, uh, as pathologists, what we do is we, we can annotate the cases and uh, uh, provide the data. Uh, rest all has to be done by the data scientists. And it's, it's their job to ensure yeah. that uh, machine learning happens and they give it back to us for validation. So, yeah, I think a team yeah, of computational okay. pathologists yes. and bioinformatics teams and yeah. uh, would be very, the most very, useful uh, to work strong, with us to develop very that. Very strong bioinformatics team is required. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, even in India now, there are a lot of uh, startups who are working on it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tangri. That was a very useful and uh, very interesting presentation. We'll thank probably you. then move on to our next session for the uh, for this morning, which is a workshop that is going to be presented by Westvox from India. Um, so I'll hand over the stage to Westvox for them to take over and uh, go ahead with your workshop session. Thank you. I'll hand it over to you. Uh, just a second.
um, while you're getting your um, workshop ready, a session ready um, to present, I probably would have to hand over the um, baton to Dr. Tangri um, to continue with, uh, you know, chairing the session for the rest of the, uh, the next upcoming sessions um, as I would need to drop. Um, so Dr. Tangri, I would um, request you to kindly take over the chairing of the sessions once the uh, workshop is completed by uh, the West Walks team. Thank you. इतने चली नहीं वीडियो इसमें उनका आया था और वो उन क्लोज वो हो गया था क्या हो गया इसमें उन्होंने जैसे यहाँ से किया था वो ये तो अभी किया पहले एडवांस था ये वीडियो पे गया बंद हो गया हमारे स्क्रीन चल तो नहीं कहते कि एक प्रेजेंटेशन देने के लिए तो मैंने जैसे ही इसमें वीडियो किया इसका चल रही है चलाओ हेलो मिस्टर जयपुर व्हाट इश्यू आर यू फेसिंग वी आर प्लेइंग वी कैन सी एनीथिंग यस 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 टीचर चल तो रहा है चला रहा था 
करने का
Mr. Chetan, are you done with your uh, slides? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank Ms. you. Dr. Rajiv, you can now continue. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for the workshop uh, from Ms. Vox. Uh, so uh, we'll continue with our sessions now. Uh, and uh, our next presentation is a poster presentation by Dr. Uma Bhatta from Nepal. And uh, she'll be presenting a poster on uh, mucinous borderline tumors with carcinosarcoma neural nodule area entity. So request Dr. Uma to share her screen. Yeah, Dr. Uma, please share your screen.
Mm. So actually, I'm not able to hear in my PC. Uh, we can hear you, Dr. Uma. But uh, actually, I'm talking from my phone and from PC, I couldn't hear. Okay. You can try uh, once more. Maybe there is a network issue. Dr. Uma, we can do one thing. We can share your slides and you can do it from your phone. Okay, yeah, I ask. think that that would be helpful. Okay, give us one minute, please. Yeah, Dr. Uma, can you uh, view the presentation? Yes, sir. Ah, so you can uh, start the presentation now. Uh, Priya, you can put it in the uh, yeah slideshow. Okay, thank you so much uh, for providing this platform. Am I clear to everyone? Uh, your voice is breaking in between, but yes, you can continue. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for providing this golden opportunity in this platform for me. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Uma, uh, there is a background noise. Probably there is a. Uh, there are two systems that are open in front of you. Yeah, you can you can mute uh, the computer. present very short case of mucinous borderline tumor with carcinosarcoma mural nodule. It's a very rare entity and uh, uh, with a poor prognosis. Actually, we had a case of 71-year-old postmenopausal female with uh, gradual increase in abdominal size over the eight months of period. Could you please proceed to the next slide? Okay, and uh, also she had associated lower back pain and decreased appetite. And on physical examination, there was a large palpable mass on the abdominal pelvic area. And with all the findings, uh, patient underwent for the CT scan and on CT scan revealed that there was a complex cystic lesion in the abdom abdominal pelvic area. And that is arising from the left ovary with 
multiple enhancing nodular and papillary projection and uh, the diagnosis suggestive of malignant ovarian neoplasm radiologically this next slide and another one and the patient underwent the surgery another slide please and uh, underwent the surgery and the left ovary was dissected measuring 20 by 20 by 9 centimeter and outer surface shows the dark focal brown areas and there was capsular bleach also noted and on cord section there was multilocular cyst with mucinous stains noted and there was a large solid area measuring 16 by 8 by 1 centimeter which was soft to form in consistency and uh, large areas of hemorrhage and necrosis were noted on gross examination. And finally, we performed the microscopic examination. Another slide, please. And under microscopic examination, there was the cyst wall lined with atypical mucinous epithelium. And their uh, mucinous epithelium shows the nuclear stratification, nuclear tufting, and filiform papilla were also noted, but there was no stromal invasion. And the, uh, the epithelial lining was of mucinous borderline tumor. And there was, this is the histological picture of mucinous borderline tumor with intestinal type differentiation and tinge of mucin are also noted. And <clears throat> Uh, uh, another slide, please. Also, there are uh, our next slide. Okay, and uh, there was the mural nodule, which composed of the solid areas of tumor cell orange in seeds and nest, and uh, that was separated by the fibrous septa, and occasional glandular structures were also noted. The tumor cells were oval to polygonal with increased in mitotic activity. Uh, pipe were every hypophil, and atypical mitotic figure were also noted. And this is the histological picture showing the mural nodule. It's composed of the tumor cells orange in uh, solid cyst, nest, and few uh, occasional glandular structures cells also noted. Next slide, please. This is the uh, okay histological picture of the mural nodule. I want to so. Uh, this is the histological uh, picture showing the cysts <clears throat> uh, of tumor cells with some occasional glandular structures. And there is also the fascicles of sp spindle separate tumor cells with marked nuclear pleomorphism and large areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. Uh, the photograph is not mentioned in this presentation actually. Next slide, please. The tumor uh, was infiltrating the left fallopian tube as well, but serosa uh, were intact. Uh, lymphovascular invasion were noted. However, there was no perineural invasion. Uh, right ovary was free of tumor. Fallopian tube and omentum of the right side are also free of tumor. And uh, with all, the final diagnosis was the mucinous borderline tumor with carcinosarcoma mural nodule was reported and according to the SSC 8th edition, next slide please, it is PT1C2NX and it has FIGO1C. Next slide please. And this is the final diagnosis of our case. Okay, next slide please. Actually, mural nodules uh, of ovarian mucinous cystic tumors are of different type, like reactive sarcoma-like mural nodule, foci of anaplastic carcinoma, and sarcomatous nodule. 
In our case, the epithelium lined by intestinal type borderline mucinous tumor areas were classical, and the mural nodule showed characteristic features of carcinosarcoma. Next slide, please. Carcinosarcoma considered to have very poor prognosis, uh, except in case of the FIGO stage 1A uh, with no tumor rupture. And, uh, and another in the idea with uh, usually confused with mural nodule, carcinosarcoma mural nodule is the malignant mixed mesodermal tumors. And uh, in case of the, and uh, next slide, please. In case of the malignant mixed mesodermal tumor, we can we uh, uh, do not find the mucinous lining epithelium. And so to differentiate this in the ID, we need to perform gross examination and uh, microscopic examination very carefully. And the careful classification of mural nodule is important for the uh, neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, Coming to the pathophysiology, next slide, please. <clears throat> there is unclear about the pathogenesis of this uh, carcinosarcoma mural nodule. Some literature says it may evolve through the divergent differentiation of mucinous neoplasm or either through the collision phenomenon. And targeted next generation sequencing has shown a clonal relationship between carcinosarcomatous neural mural nodule and the ovarian mucinous tumor, indicating there is the DD differentiation process. In our uh, next slide, please. In our case, the diagnosis was completely the morphological diagnosis, since we didn't have the facility of immunohistochemistry in our center. And so we couldn't perform the immunohistochemistry and uh, diagnosis or uh, the morphological diagnosis. And uh, next slide. And thus the careful gross examination and extensive sampling are crucial for the correct diagnosis. The outcome of cystic ovarian epithelial tumor with mural nodule depends on the histology of the nodule, whether it is carcinoma or sarcoma and the stage of the disease. Thus, it is very important to determine the exact component of the mural nodule since the prognosis of this tumor is related to its histology. And finally, I am done with, and thank you from Nepal. Thank you, Dr. Uma, for uh, the presentation of a rare case presentation. Uh, so uh, we can take up if there are any questions. So I think there are no questions from the audience. So uh, just one question from my side. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the mural nodule. So was it just one nodule or multiple nodules? And how big was the size of the nodules? Single nodules, sir. And uh, size was, uh, uh, was large. It is often made by one centimeter. Thank you. Uh, it was indeed a very interesting case. And uh, there is a com comment also uh, in the chat box of the same. Very interesting case. Thanks. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Uma, uh, for the case presentation. Uh, so uh, now uh, I think... Uh, It's one o'clock and uh, it's a time for lunch break from 1.10 to 1.40. So we can uh, have the lunch break now before the next presentation, which is at uh, 1.40 London time. Uh, so uh, we can break for lunch now and we can meet at sharp 1.40 again for the next presentation.
So uh, welcome back to the post lunch session uh, of the conference. Uh, so uh, we will start the session in a minute. Uh, I'll introduce the next next speaker. Next uh, our next speaker is Dr. Marwa Karifa. She is uh, from Tunisia, and uh, she'll be presenting a poster on uh, telangiectatic osteosarcoma versus aneurysmal cyst. So. Uh, Dr. Marwa, you can share your screen now. Yeah, the screen is visible. Uh, you can switch on to the... Yeah, you can switch on the slideshow mode. Sorry, it's okay. Hello. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Baba. Hello. So uh, I'm Dr. Marwa Kidifa. I'm Dr. Mara Kifa, uh, a pathology, pathological resident in Tunisian uh, hospitals, and I'm um, pleased to present to you a case report entitled Telangiectasic Osteosarcoma versus a neurismal bone cyst of the right upper extremity of the, fume, of the femur. So it was uh, about a six year old girl who suffered uh, of a diaphysal fracture of the femur in August 2020, she was operated with the uh, anteromedullary pinning. In January uh, 2021, uh, she presented a functional impotence with a significant edema of the right lower lung. The X ray uh, exam, exam of the right lower lung showed a diaphysal eccentric multi Loculated lytic lesion of the right uh, femur extended to the adjacent soft uh, tissue with cortical thinning. As we see here, the lesion was multi loculated. The scan showed a uh, 83 millimeter extensal diaphysal lesion of the upper extremity of the femur surrounded by a peripheral sclerotic border with central lesional septa and the thinning of the cortical bone. So the surgical decision was the, to biopsy the lesion. Uh, the pathological analysis concluded to, uh, to an orthopedic university center where uh, Concrete-like material formation. The cellular septa were rich in multinucleated osteoclast-like uh, giant cells arranged in the periphery of the blood filled spaces. Without any cellular etypia, and uh, those um, multinucleated cells were associated to fibroblasts. Staff between the also the diagnosis retained was an aneurysmal cyst of the upper extremity of the right femur. So we we'll pass to the discussion. The aneurysmal bone cyst is a benignant bone lesion, locally destructive and classified according to the.
Uh, Dr. Marva, we can't see the presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it is visible now. You can switch on to the slideshow mode. So I continue uh, with discussion or uh, I returned, return to... Uh, yeah, you can go back a couple of slides because uh, there was some error in your uh, connection also. So we got here you the last couple of slides. Yeah, from here. So uh, a second surgical biopsy was done. Uh, the cross examination uh, showed four hemorrhagic fragments of cystic aspect. Uh, of cystic aspect measuring between 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 centimeter. The pathology, uh, the microscopic uh, exam uh, showed a lesion formed by blood filled spaces of variable size separated by cellular septa. The lesion was uh, associated to a thin reactive bone and chondroid like material formation. The cellular septa were rich in uh, multinucleated osteoclast giant cells arranged in the periphery of the blood filled space without any cellular atypia and associated to fibroblasts. After a uh, multidisciplinary staff between the orthopedist, the radiologist, and the pathologist, the diagnosis retained was an aneurysmal cyst of the upper extremity of the right femur. We pass to the discussion. The aneurysmal bone cyst is a benign bone lesion, locally destructive and classified according to the latest uh, whole classification as a tumor rich in osteoclastic giants. Yes. It presents 2% of benign bone tumors. Uh, it touched as well, uh, the, uh, as well the male and the female in the second decade. It's often uh, localized in the metaphase, metaphases of the long bones. There are two types of uh, aneurysmal bone cyst, the primary and the secondary uh, type. So, and to differentiate between those two types, uh, an extensive sampling uh, is uh, critical to rule out an underlying primary lesion. The secondary uh, aneurysmal bone cyst is more common in fibro, fibros, uh, dysplasia, chondroblastoma, osteoblastoma, and osteosarcoma. The aneurysmal bone cyst has the particularity of local recurrence. The patient uh, often, uh, with aneurysmal bone cyst often suffer of pain and swelling of the lump and may uh, suffer of a pathological fracture. In case of uh, spine involvement, uh, the patient may suffer of uh, symptoms of spinal cord compression. Radiology description, uh, the X, uh, the standard X-ray show uh, often an eccentric multi-local septated lacrimal lesion, local, locally 
localized in the metaphases of the long bones. The scan uh, show a lytic, lysistic image, multi-located, surrounded by a fine bo uh, bone border and associated to a periosteal reaction. The MRI is the most radiologic specific exam for description of the aneurysmal bone uh, cyst. It shows a multilocular cyst, cystic lesion with fluid fluid levels. The cross uh, examination uh, of aneurysmal bone cyst uh, show, uh, shows a spongy multiloculated hemorrhagic lesion with variable size and irregular sharply demarcated borders with thin shell of reactive bone, as we see here. The microscopic description. Uh, show a multi-loculated cystic lesion formed of blood-filled cystic spaces separated by cellular septa. Those uh, cellular septa contain fibroblasts, giant cells, and woven bone. A locally uh, chondroid-like material is associated. The necrosis is uh, not common, but mitotic activity is easily identified. There is no cytologic ITP. So as we see here, the blood filled spaces surrounded by, <clears throat> by cellular septa uh, containing uh, fibroblasts and osteoclast like multinucleated giant cells. There is no specific diagnostic immunohistochemical uh, stain. We often found a US, USP6 uh, gene fusion with uh, CDH11 uh, in 30%. We often, uh, uh, we often, uh, we only observed uh, this uh, rearrangement in uh, the primary lesion. Uh, the aneurysmal bone cyst could be treated with curtage or in block resection, percutaneous fluorotherapy with doxycycline, arterial embolization, and uh, steroid or calcitonin injection. The main di uh, differential diagnosis uh, of the aneurysmal bone cyst is the teleangiectasic osteosarcoma which presents 3% of osteosarcoma. It, um, the clinical, uh, as well as uh, imaging of uh, teleangiectasic osteosarcoma is uh, similar to aneurysmal bone cyst. It has similar architecture, but contains uh, anaplastic stromal cells with frequent atypical mitosis. There is no specific diagnostic immunohistochemical stain. Uh, the molecular, uh, the molecular biology shows a lack of the ASP6 uh, uh, gene rearrangement. Other, uh, other differential uh, diagnosis, uh, on the, uh, the other differential diagnosis. Uh, are essential bone cyst, giant cell tumor of bone, and bone hemangioma. So in conclusion, although they are benign, aneurysmal bone cysts can display different clinical natural courses, quiescent, active, or aggressive. The recurrence rate of 15 to 30% has been described. The most important differential diagnosis is uh, the teleangiectasic osteosarcoma. Often in difficult cases, uh, clinical radiological and pathological collaboration is necessary in order to properly decide between the different lesions. And thank you for your attention.
thank you, Dr. Marwa, for an interesting case presentation. Uh, indeed, uh, a difficult differential diagnosis, both uh, on radiology as well as on pathology. Uh, but uh, uh, the treatment options and uh, the outcome is very, very different in both the cases. So it is very important for pathologists to ensure uh, a correct diagnosis in such cases. And you rightly mentioned that uh, correlation, collaboration between pathologists and radiologists and uh, the clinician, the orthopedic surgeon is very, very important in such cases. So thank you very much. Uh, the house is open to questions. We can take a few questions. There are no questions in the chat box as of now. Uh, I think there are no questions otherwise also. So uh, we can uh, end the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Marwa, for Thank the you. interesting presentation. We now move on to the next presentation. Our next speaker is Professor Hulia uh, uh, Belkaralaldi. Uh, sorry for uh, if I pronounced it incorrectly. Uh, she is from uh, Algeria, and uh, the topic that uh, Dr. Huria, Professor Hulia is presenting is multifocal small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of jejunoileal uh, with celiac disease mimicking Burkitt lymphoma. Uh, it's a case report. So I hand over uh, the, the, the stage to the Professor Huria. So over to you, Professor. Good afternoon, everybody. You hear me, please? Hello? Uh, yes, you are audible. You can share you can your screen. Share, you can share my presentation, please. OK. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Hori Ferladi. I am pathologist at Gilele Liedes University Medicine Department. Today, I'd like to talk to you about multifocal poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma of jejuno ileal with celiac disease. I have divided my presentation into three parts. Uh, we start with introduction, discussion, and conclusion. Let's start introduction. Small bowel lymphoma and adenocarcinoma are recognized complications of celiac disease. All two neuroendocrine tumor are among the most common neoplasts of the small bowel. Their association with celiac disease is extremely rare and is limited to the few case report. We report a case of multifocal poorly differentiated small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of digital alien with celiac disease who had refused to go on gluten-free diet. Next one, please. The case, 30 years lady or lady with a history of celiac disease since her childhood at the age of 16 years, in front of, of the absence of the symptomatology, the patient decided to enter her gluten free diet. In January 2012, the patient was at the gastroenterology department for chronic diarrhea, her loss, weight loss of 4 kilograms, evolving for six months. Clinical examination was, was normal except in abdominal distension. Blood tests revealed a significant microcytic, normocytic, hypochromic anemia. Upper GE endoscopy showed a degree of the height of the diagonal fold with the hatchet aspect. The, diagnos the diagnosis of celiac disease was confirmed on positive, positive serology and definitive histological change on diadenal biopsy, venous atrophy, grade 4, and the rate of ultra-epithelial lymphocyte if greater than 
40%. The patient refused to go on gluten-free diet despite repeated counseling. In September 2013, the patient had, has been admitted for an acute bowel obstruction. Abdominal CT scan revealed the circumferential thinking of 40, 14 millimeter of the jejunal extending over seven centimeters. At the emergency laboratory, presence of three intraluminal tumor lesions of the small intestine. Grossly, we have received two pieces of intestinal resection. The first one, is a piece of intestinal ileal resection measuring 10 centimeters with two nodular formations measuring respectively 5 and 1 centimeter of screen the lumen. The second piece of, of intestinal jejunal resection measuring 8 centimeters with any Ulcerative polypoid formation measuring four centimeter. Microscopy showed poorly differentiation in the neoplasm and further trail the bowel wall of the cerosal to the cerosal surface. In the second one, donc, uniform tumor cells arranged in trabecular and solid pattern and were separated by abandoned thin wall vessels. In this slide, the tumor cells were small to intermediate, mitotically active with round or over hyperchromatic nuclei scanty cytoplasm and many apoptotic cells. In this slide, many apoptotic cells and macrophages carry a starry sky appearance mimicking Burkitt lymphoma. We show in this slide a foci of necrosis. And in the last one, the mucosal surface in involvement by tumor was flat, and there were intraepithelial lymphocytes with crypt hyperplasia and heavy lymphoplasmocytic infiltration of the lumina propria showing feature of celiac disease. Humanohistochemistry, humanohistochemistry were negative for lymphoid marker, Serge, CD3, CD10, CD20, BCL6, and BCL2. BCL2 are negative, the cells are negative, also for uh, BCL6. The immunohistochemistry uh, showed any intense reactivity for cytokeratin. And also the cell, the cell tumor are positive for chromogranin A, A, and synaptophysin. Strong positivity for tumor cells for T67, 90% uh, of uh, cell tumor are positive express the key 67. HMB 
45 was negative. We have eliminated the melanoma. So the cell, in conclusion of immunohistochemistry, the cell, the, the tumor cells are positive for cytokeratin, chromogranin A, synaptophysin, in SL, key 7667 and are negative for CD2, CD20, CD10, BCL2, BCL6, HMB45. Final diagnosis, all these findings are in accordance with multifocal, poorly differentiated small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of digital allele grade three, according to classification 2017 with celiac disease. The question, neuroendocrine tumor are rare with any annual incidence has been estimated to be one to two cases per, per 100,000 people representing only 2% of all of the, t the, the GT tracts. Poorly differentiated endocrine carcinoma have been variously called atypical carcinoid, out cell carcinoma, and small cell carcinoma. These tumors are rare and highly aggressive. Fewer than 30 cases has been recorded in the literature. Digital alien lesion accounts for 23 to 30% of all GE neuroendocrine tumor, making this site the second most frequent location of neuroendocrine tumor. Patient range in age from the third to tenth decade with a peak in the sixth and seventh decade. The, the male female ratio is three for one. The features of jejunoelial neuroendocrine tumor are usually non-specific, but the most propounds presenting with the most people patient presenting with obstructive jaundice, vague abdominal pain, and weight loss. The predisposition of celiac patient to small bowel lymphoma and adenocarcinoma is well established by Simpson and on. Nets or owl of lower duodenum and alien are not generally associated with pre neoplastic lesion. However, the, the, the association of net and celiac disease is limited to a few case reports which was initially described by Gardner, after that by Tucker. The author suggests that the tumor has arisen in the background of intracryptal endocrine cells, hyperplasia, which is reported to occur in some patients with celiac disease. They have been also reported focal microproliferation of enterochromaffin cells in case of multiple digital allele carcinoid. The relationship between the hyperplasia and enterochromaffin cells in, in celiac disease and development of NET must be considered. Also, the association may be coincidental. CT, MRE, and scintigraphic imaging with radio labelled somatostatin is widely used to locate previously undetected primary or metastatic lesion. lesion. Grossly, the tumor were relatively small to a uh, two to three centimeter, focally ulcerated or portable lesion. They usually appear as deep mucosal, submucosal nodule, deep infiltration to the muscular wall, and peritoneal is frequent. Digenoalian endocrine tumor may be multiple in about 25 to 40 percent of cases. Histologically, we will sheet 
file nest or small uh, of small or intermediate mitotically active cells with round or oval hyperchromatic nuclei scatty cytoplasm. Cytoplasm. Generally, these cells show a higher nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. Fossil of necrosis and vascular invasion are marked. Mesenteric arteries and veins located near the tumor or away from it may be thickened and their lumen narrowed or often occluded by any elastic sclerosis, which may lead to ischemic lesion in the intestine. Next, who classification of uh, tumor, the neuroendocrine tumor, uh, by classification, uh, the last one, uh, classification of uh, who, 2017, no real morphology, it's uh, um, uh, it's depend the morphology, key 67 and the my, uh, mitotic index, no endocrine tumor, grade one. It's well uh, differentiated. Uh, inferior to the uh, P76, uh, 67, uh, inferior to percent. And for mitotic and inferior to percent, no endocrine tumor grade two. It's well, uh, also well differentiated, but the key, uh, key 70, 67 between three to 20 percent. For no endocrine tumor grade three, well, uh, also well differentiated, but the key 67 upper than greater than 20 percent no green carcinoma grade 3 is different for no green tumor grade 3 it's poor differentiated it's poor differentiated the morphology is poorly differentiated you talk about carcinoma in, but not uh, tumor can no green carcinoma, carcinoma grade 3 it's poorly differentiated the cells is small or large, with also key, key 60, 67 greater than 20 percent. The comparison between a nuts tumor, neuroendocrine tumor grade 3 versus neuroendocrine carcinoma grade 3 is neuroendocrine tumor grade 3. There is mutation, uh, mutation of men, DAX, ATRX6, well differentiated because uh, morphology is very important, well differentiated. It's the low grade poorly response to cisplatin and the key is uh, the same for neuroendocrine carcinoma. The comparison is only for morphology for carcinoma poorly differentiated uh, small or large cell. It's aggressive for carcinoma, no component of uh, low grade re and response to cisplatin. In Yumiya histochemistry, most re recent recommendations consider in first line that only two known endocrine markers, chromogranin A and synaptophysin, are necessarily and significant if, you uh, if they are uh, positive. This affirms the diagnosis, the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor. The use of other neuroendocrine neuro markers, such as CD56, is not justified only for poorly uh, carcinoma, poorly differentiated. The use of NSA is strongly discouraged by international recommendation due to its total lack of specificity. The differential diagnosis, diagnosis include metastatic small cell carcinoma, lymphoma, metastatic melanoma, sarcoma, 
plant, the, immuno, the immunohistochemistry, clinical examination, and the radiology may be necessary in making this differential. In addition, the surgery, systemic chemo surgery, so in addition to surgery, systemic chemotherapy and radiation are used for treatment. However, the prognosis is uh, for this tumor type is informally poor and highly aggressive, followed by a rapidly fatal course, surviving only six weeks uh, to uh, 17 months. Informally, for our patient, post operative convalescence was complicated by bone metastasis, and she died two months after the diagnosis was made and no therapy could be initiated. In conclusion, the case discussed is exceptional with aggressive bi biological behavior that can confuse it histologically with lymphoma or carcinoma. Therefore, we believe that the concurrent diagnostic diagnosis 